please welcome Professor Dr. Mushta Al Atabi. Great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Look at this. This is a picture was taken in the late 1800s. And it's in a factory where they, they are rolling cigarettes. So you see people are rolling cigarettes. And there is a gentleman, very well dressed, feeling very relaxed, sitting at a high chair, reading the newspaper. Who do you think this person is? Where is his job? Supervisor, absolutely. So I have put this picture around the world, and always people answer, supervisor, the manager. And interestingly, this is the wrong answer. This person is not a supervisor. This person is a lector, L-E-C-T-O-R. This person is paid to read the newspaper to the workers. Yes, yes, absolutely. And this is a job that you've never heard of it because it disappeared even before you were born. Now, why is this interesting? If you, like me, read all these reports that come from time to time and talks about the number of jobs that are going to be replaced by robots and are going to disappear, it's a really a very scary uh, kind of picture. So you look at 800 million could lose their jobs. 375 million will, will have to change jobs. So will we'll remain in employability, in employed, gainful employment, but they have to change their jobs. So these are things are very stressful. And imagine if you are an 18, 17, 18 year old, where you have to start picking a course and start to chart your, 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 your journey in life. Now, in order for us to understand how does the job creation and destruction work, I think a mental model is very necessary so that we can make sort of decisions for ourselves, for our children, but also for our students. Now, personally, I believe that every human being brings to any endeavor that we have three things. We bring our physical labor, our capability to do things, move things, run, fight, whatever. We also bring our cognitive labor, our ability to think, realize, uh, and, and so on. And we, we, we bring our emotional labor. We bring these at different levels. So for example, physical labor could be as simple as I sweep the floor, doesn't need you know, much training, to do some preci precision work where the dexterity itself would require a lot of training. The cognitive labor can start at the level of memory, just memorizing a set of numbers or memorizing the multiplication table, we could move up to the level of critical thinking or, or, or creativity, which is the, the ethics of cognitive labor. When it comes to emotional labor, it starts from awareness, being aware of ourselves, of the existence of other people, but it moves towards regulation, having a sense of purpose, and also empathy, building relationships, and also ethics. So these are the things that we bring with different combination, regardless of the work that we do. Now, interestingly, again, we have been on a journey of replacing ourselves, because we as humans, we are a bit lazy. So we, would, we don't want to do much work. And we have been trying to get uh, machines, technology, to do the work on our behalf. So since the invention of the wheel, 3,500 BC, we have been on a journey to create some technology to replace us in, 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 that, in, that, in that domain. And up to the, uh, around the time of the Industrial Revolution, some of the physical work was, uh, we, we were able to, uh, to um, automate it or to get some machines or the animals to do on, on our behalf. Now, as time goes by, we, and right around the time of the uh, Industrial Revolution, there was an explosion in terms of the uh, 
technology that did the physical work on our behalf. We started to build machines that are faster, more precise, stronger than us. As a matter of fact, 1870 is a very special year because uh, a, a gentleman with the name of John Henry, he used to dig mines manually. And every time uh, the industry creates a, a mechanical digger, they would they would bid that digger against John Henry, and John Henry was always winning. And people thought that you will never be able to build a machine as strong as, as, as a human. Until in 1870, there was a new model. John Henry uh, raced against it. John Henry was able to win, but he, he won by a very small margin, and he died at the end of the competition. Right after that, there was no more human being that can beat the machine in the physical field. But also at around that time, we started to create mechanical computers. They were able to do a little bit of the cognitive work that we do, uh, do a bit of ca uh, calculation and multiplication and things like that. Now, 1997 was another very interesting year because that was the first time a computer was able to beat a human, the, not only a human being, but the human champion in chess. And since then, there is no more human who is able to beat machines in chess. So the shaded area, if you, if you look at it, these are areas that either have been automated or if we want, we can automate them. So for example, the um, burger flippers in McDonald's, we still use people to do it, but this is not because we can't do the machine, but because the humans are so cheap. The moment you increase the minimum wage, then the industry will go and um, all McDonald's is going to be, uh, you have uh, burger flippers who are machines. And this is expected to continue. So if you look at this side of the graph, you have all these skills that we, we sort of bring to the table. And as we move on, we get the machines to do them. And this is what we are really left with. It's, it's our ability to do creativity, critical thinking, and also our ability to do the emotional bit, the emotional intelligence. So that's why it's so important nowadays for us to develop emotional intelligence in our children, in our students, and even in ourselves. This is going to be so important for us to even get, uh, get, get jobs. Now, while this is a very important thing, emotional intelligence, for us to remain relevant in this century, the data about mental health are really scary. So the number of suicides increasing, the number of depression cases is increasing the world over. So you just imagine, this is a huge pressure that is happening here. We need to be more emotionally intelligent so that we even retain our jobs, but at the same time, we and our youth specifically are getting uh, you know, more stressed and, and uh, they're harming themselves and, 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 and this is you know, going, going on. So uh, this is, was from a couple of uh, weeks ago, alarming spike in mental health issues was the uh, Malaysian Mental Health Association. So it is really becoming a big thing. Now, a few years ago, I started a massive open online course on emotional intelligence and I uh, taught, sort of taught, developed, helped people develop their emotional intelligence. The first thing, people need to understand what emotional intelligence is. So emotional intelligence is our ability first to be self-aware, our ability to manage, so self-awareness, self-management, and it's also the social awareness and the relationship management. And there are very specific skills very specific capabilities that we all can learn if we put enough effort and, and, and develop them. So how did, how, did, how did I do that? How did we do that? Um, you know, we teach the students how the brain works. Very important for us to learn how our brains work. We teach them about the connection between the brain and, 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 and body. We also teach them self-management capabilities. We teach them self-awareness uh, uh, exercises and, and, and things like that. So uh, I, I won't go through the, the details of this, but the idea is, you know, people who take the course, they, they sometimes they are uh, facing a lot of difficulty. This is Bashirat, one of my students. He's from Africa. 
And uh, she had a very difficult time in her life. Her father and her husband died in, in, in an accident. And after she took the course and she did the, the exercises, she was able to write a book. So her book is From Pain to Purpose. And she's carrying it next to my book. So the other one is Shoot the Boss, which is, which is my book, which I wrote about the experience uh, in, 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 the, in the course. So before I move to the video, we started realizing that very smart students who come to our university who have done very well academically they lack very basic skills including self-confidence and self-esteem and that's why we decided to do something about it we started a program we called the youth transformation program this program open for anyone who have just completed form 5 or an SPM and the students come for and for two weeks we teach them about how the brain work we teach them about what happens in their brain when emotions arise and we teach them how to deal with these emotions we teach them how to do work with other people how to present themselves but a key element of the course is to teach them how to say thank you and the idea is we all think we know how to say thank you, don't we? Thank you, Prof. Karim, for inviting me, for example. But the right way of saying thank you would be by first, specifically saying what, what are you grateful for. Number two, you need to say how did that thing that you are thanking the other person for help you. Number three, you need to acknowledge what did the person who did that favor to you do and what did he or she sacrifice? And finally, what character strength did that person exhibit? So the students really go through this and they, they uh, uh, decided to, as an exercise at the end of the course, to actually thank their parents. So we encourage them to script it, we encourage them to write it, we encourage them to even read it from a written note so that you don't forget all these, all these elements. This is a, a video that we've re recorded for four of these students thanking their uh, uh, parents. So they allow us to record them and allow us to, uh, to actually uh, play this video here. So let me just play this video. I said, Doctor, I can do so many things to make you know, be happy and be proud of you. From the time I couldn't speak properly at a young age and being a very shy little girl to being someone who is confident and very determined to achieve anything. First, thank you for never give up on our family or on me. Thank you for working so, so, so hard to be able to send me to university. And for that, I will never be able to repay you. Mani, I like to say that you are my superwoman, my best friend and the best mom in the entire universe. You will still encourage me and tell me to never give up. I'd like to thank you for fully supporting me in whatever I do and letting me explore by my own instead of limiting my potential. Although I had made many mistakes, 
you will always forgive me. I am grateful for your kindness. Without you, there is no me and I would certainly not be reading this out loud to you right now. But because of your unconditional love and support, I was able to muster up all my courage to read this in front of you. From day one, you have been my support system. Thank you for thousands and thousands of dollars you and dad spend on my education. So Ma, I just want to say thank you for always being my home therapist 24-7. I love you, Mommy, forever and always. Love, Ellie. Thank you. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not touching. As educators, I ask myself and I ask you, whose life we are going to touch today? I have played this video around the world, and almost without failure, someone would come and say, you know, I've decided to send a text to my mother or to my father or to my son to just say thank you for something that they have, they have done. As a matter of fact, one of the mothers, she came to us and she thanked us, and she said, did you know that I have never said thank you to my own mother? And the fact that... She, she is still with us, I am feeling blessed, and I'm going to actually go and, and thank her. So, in conclusion, I would like to say that what really makes us humans, the thing that the machine cannot do, is only two things. is our ability for creativity and innovation, and our ability for emotional intelligence. And I think if, the, if education has to develop anything, it should focus on those two things. Thank you very much.